coal industry, they're not, they're not the bad guys. They're playing by the rules. Uh, but they're playing hard and they don't want to lose their vested interest. They probably should look at climate change and say, look, this is a real problem we need to deal with. But they're making money and they're not breaking the rules. So why would they stop? We need to change the rules. I've been pretty excited about energy justice and uh, the first thing that comes to mind uh, when I try to explain what it is to people is the, the classic triangle. You've got economics at the top, you've got politics and you've got the environment. And right up until now, it's really been economics that has dominated the discourse with regard to energy resources. In Australia, the energy landscape is very complicated and obviously there's a shift towards a low carbon energy future. The challenge that, that Australia faces, that the world faces, is actually understanding how do we achieve that in a way that is reliable, cost-effective and has that sustainable element underpinning that transition. I'm sort of stunned at the lack of progress as an outsider uh, who's come back. Currently in the US, even with the Trump administration, we've seen another 20 um, coal power stations um, shut down. I think people are taking a lot more control and interest in their own energy, at least in some situations, because they are uh, dissatisfied with the energy sector. They don't trust what companies are necessarily doing with that energy and, and they don't trust that they're giving them a fair price. And so they're looking for other alternatives that put them back in charge of their own power, literally. Australia has a large coal export industry and it's one of our biggest trade earners. If we shut down the coal export industry, that's really going to hurt our national budget. So we need to find ways to reinvent the economy to stop earning money out of exporting fossil fuel and earn money through other ways. I think there is a scope for coal to be phased out by 2050 in this country. Before that, it will be difficult. The Adani mine is mainly to export coal to India. India is a resource poor country, still heavily reliant on coal, but their domestic resources are very, very poor quality coal. The Adani mine's interesting. If we're looking at this triangle, it seems it, it hits the economic button. So it seems that there's going to be great exports for Queensland. It seems that there are going to be great jobs for people in the area. It's certainly political. And then at the other end of the triangle, we've got the environment. So Adani hits all those energy justice buttons. But at the end of the day, we're talking for fossil fuel. And um, why are we spending so much time and energy talking about coal when just as many jobs could be generated and there'd be so much, uh, the, 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 the environmental benefits would be so much greater if that sort of energy, uh, political energy, was put into thinking about solar and wind. There are a few unanswered questions still remaining which have to be dealt with. So it's not necessarily it's right to say that the mine is going ahead. For the benefit of the Indian population, it should go ahead provided all the regulatory limits are very strictly enforced on it. The incumbents have the power. So the, the large energy retailers, generation companies, they are already in the game, they've already invested. Quite often they've had the advantage of a lot of government subsidies from many decades ago when a lot of the assets were built. 
But in terms of action on the ground, we have the highest penetration of rooftop PV. In the last two years, we've seen a dramatic rise in the installation of utility scale PV. We're one of the world leaders in terms of installing wind power around the world. You could consider this an energy gold rush. If you imagine a, an area um, that's only 250 kilometers by 250 kilometers, which is a very small um, block of land in the context of, of the Australian mainland, that area with solar cells in the right spots in Australia can generate the whole electricity supply of the world. Energy storage is a really critical part of the problem. Yeah. Wind only generates power when the wind's blowing. Solar doesn't produce power at night. The biggest demand period for electricity is in the early evening as the sun's setting. So if we're going to build lots of PV and wind, which are the cheapest of the renewable technologies, we're going to need to be able to store that power in some shape or form. It takes um, about two years of operational time of a solar cell to actually just repay the energy costs of making that device. But a silicon cell will last you 25 years. And so you have 23 years of production of clean energy. And that's, that's actually remarkable. We're going to have some large scale gen, uh, storage, um, whether it's going to be um, uh, big Tesla batteries or not remains to be seen. My money still at the moment is on the technology pumped hydro, off river pumped hydro, not snow 2.0 type because you need dams for that and, and rivers and so forth, but actually ones where you just have water circulating in an area and there's been a lot of good work done uh, around Australia on that. The technology to move that energy out of that location to China or India or other massively populous parts of the world that's the big issue right now, is, and that brings us back to either hydrogen as a, an energy carrier or in the not too distant future, ammonia as an energy carrier. Ammonia is actually a very energetic compound. We know well how to move it around, put it on ships, put it in pipelines. If we can generate that from solar electricity efficiently, then we have the whole system basically figured out. The scene changes, you know, rapidly. It's, it's changing probably on a, on a half a year by half a year basis at the moment. So I understand the, the difficulties that uh, the planners have um, and the advisors of our politicians have in picking the right course. Uh, and in the end, I suspect there's going to be one, more than one right course that we have to follow. There's no magic bullet, and ultimately what uh, we need to be aware of is that consumers just want supply energy that is reliable and low cost. It is dramatic, the rise in energy prices um, that's happened since around 2007. Um, they've more than doubled. There's four kind of reasons which um, electricity prices could be rising. First is whether wholesale costs are, are increasing. Uh, the second is whether sort of transmission and distribution, these kind of network costs have been increasing. The third is whether retail margins have been increasing. And fourth, there's kind of the recovery of uh, environmental program costs which get passed through to your bill. Recent reports out of the ACCC have shown that retailers do charge different prices to different people. You may think that being a loyal customer gets you a good deal. What we kind of see is that people who have been with the same retailer for multiple years tend to get charged the highest prices because they're not attentive, they're not searching and trying to get a better deal. At the moment, there is a lot of distrust in the energy sector, particularly um, by the households or residential energy consumers. There's a lot of interest in creating a sort of Airbnb or Uber-style trading platform which would allow households to share, donate or sell their energy to other people in the community or other households. Uber is an example, Airbnb is an example of an assetless intermediary. Airbnb doesn't own any hotels, Uber doesn't own any cars. We could see that happening, I think, in energy markets. We will see it happening. It is revolutionary. Uh, it, it really is an industrial revolution. I think the interesting thing about the energy grid is that it's always been driven by people. And I think quite often the energy sector forgets that. It's consumer demand and, and, and people's use of energy that actually creates the need for energy and drives the investment in the sector. Politically, it's been a disaster. We've had climate policy coming and going, shifting targets, you know, really difficult for investors to predict what's going to happen in the future. Everyone in the electricity market is playing a game. 
You're trying to work out what your competitors are doing, trying to understand what the future investment is going to look like, and then you lay your bets. You say, well, we think that wind power is going to be a winner. We're going to invest in wind power. Another company might say, no, we think solar power is going to be the way to go. There's a lot of money at stake. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and there's a lot of what economists call a coordination problem. That is to get people to move, for example, from petrol vehicles to electric vehicles. Nobody's going to be the first one to move if there's no infrastructure in place. The infrastructure is not going to be in place if there's no vehicles on the road. So we have a classic chicken and the egg problem. Large companies have clearly said that renewables is the way to go. Um, um, and that's in Europe, that's in the US, that's in the Middle East. We have shown that you can save money and procure basically net zero electricity for an organisation like Monash. Today, with no subsidies, we will be net zero electricity by about 2021. Before coming to uh, Monash, I was working at Microsoft, um, Chief Economic Policy Strategist for Microsoft Corporation. Microsoft instituted an internal carbon tax and the sky has not fallen. Eventually, I think large companies together with the general public will be the drivers of change to change the mindset of the political decision makers.